There's a saying that I've heard a bunch of times when it comes to practices and organizations, and it's this, people join the practice because they see something great, but when they quit, it's because they're quitting their boss. If that feels like you, or that sounds like you, or you know somebody who's like that, then you're going to want to listen to this episode because my guest today thinks that when people quit their boss, it's almost always because that employee just was not engaged. My name is Carl White. I'm principal at Mark Advisory Group, which is a healthcare marketing agency, and I'm also the host of Practice Care, which is about simplified advice, bite-sized pieces of advice for the business side of your practice. And today, my guest is Ashi Arora. Ashi is the principal executive coach at iRise Executive Coaching. She's had over 20 years of executive and administrator level experience in operations, healthcare, professional mentoring, and coaching. iRise Executive Coaching provides services to individuals and groups who are seeking enhanced performance and productivity. Ashi provides strengths-based executive coaching through an individualized program that's designed to enhance management acumen, self-awareness, and emotional intelligence. And Ashi, it is great to have you on Practice Care. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Thanks, Carl. I'm excited to be here talking to you today. Yeah. And the reason is because I've worked in a bunch of different organizations, large and small, and it's pretty obvious to hear me say that The success of an organization more than anything else comes down to the people that are in it. Great people can fix lots of things, not everything, but lots of things. And the way to get greatness out of people is leadership. And one of the most important things that leaders have to do is to keep their people engaged. And so we're going to try to tackle the term employee engagement, which is, you know, has a lot of different definitions depending on who you ask. But before we get into that and, and your thoughts on it, can you give us an example because you work with with uh, leaders and organizations all the time, healthcare practices and other organizations. Yeah. Just an example so that we can start to wrap our heads around what employee engagement means. Yeah. So before I go into the definition, yeah, I'd love to tell a client story. So just like you, Carl, I've worked in small and large healthcare organizations, and I coach leaders, both clinicians and non-clinicians from a variety of different levels. And pre-pandemic, I coached a physician practice owner who was struggling with trying to understand, and and she felt like she had done it all in terms of how to keep a stable workforce. She had about in the past year before I started working with her, like a 75% staff turnover rate. Yeah, super, super high, brutal. brutal. So it's like every time she was training certain like MAs or working with even like billers, it, it, there was this constant turnover and she couldn't figure it out. And she's like, I buy them gifts. I take them on trips. I've raised their salary and yet they, they keep leaving. I, I don't, I don't know what else to do. And so we worked together for about the first six months was to stabilize the situation. And then after a year, we were able to bring that down to almost nothing. And one of the really big ways we tackled this was engagement, was identifying the different factors in employee engagement and helping her understand that to create a more engaged culture in her practice. And did she learn along the way that money and trips and things just don't seem to matter very much to engagement? Yep, she sure did. She sure did. Yeah. So I want to get into it because I've heard the term employee engagement a lot, and I've heard it from leaders at different levels of organizations that I've worked at. Out comes the word employee engagement, and what follows it is a definition that's completely different from what I've heard from others. And, and I just looked at that, and I go, this, it's just fluffy. Like, I don't know what to make of it, because I, I don't hear the same definition twice, even remotely twice. So let's start with basics. What is employee engagement? Yeah, so I am a strength certified coach through Gallup, and Gallup is most well known for the Gallup poll. Anything related to politics is usually got Gallup all over it. So they are a data analytics giant. What people don't realize is they're also a data giant in workplace analytics. And so the term employee engagement was actually first coined by them. And the way they define it is the involvement and enthusiasm of employees in their work and workplace. So it's not only about employees putting in the time, but it's also really having energy and passion in the work that they're doing. Now, that 
definition still sounds a little bit fluffy, but because like I told you, they're a huge data analytics giant, they have millions of data points of research behind this to classify employees in three categories, engaged, disengaged, and actively disengaged. So I'm going to go through and define those three metaphors. So there's one positive and two negatives. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I know, a little bit, a little bit interesting, right? Yeah. A little bit strange. So in the U.S., so their their data is worldwide, but in the U.S. specifically, on average, an organization has about 30 to 35 percent of an engaged workforce. So companies and organizations that go above that mark are the ones that you're really seeing higher levels of productivity and profitability, according to the Gallup research. So when we look at when we start looking at small practices, 35% is not a lot, especially if you have, let's say, five or six people in your practice. So you really want to work harder to strive in getting that engaged group a lot larger. So what are the differences between these three groups? So think of a piece of trash, like a piece of paper on the floor, like in your hallway, okay, at your workplace. The engaged employee is going to pick it up, throw it in the trash can. The disengaged person who's there putting in their time, kind of doing the work, but maybe not having the same energy and passion as the engaged employee is probably going to ignore that piece of paper, just pretend that it's kind of not there. The actively disengaged is going to either kick that piece of paper or throw more paper on the floor with it. I mean, these are people that like really don't want to be there. And in fact, might be a little bit more toxic to your environment because they're going to try to move those disengaged people also to the actively disengaged. They're the people that gossip more. You know, they're the ones that um, seem to have a bit more of a negative attitude. And now that might be being triggered by something happening with the leadership, with the physicians in the practice. Um, sometimes it's not. And so it's really identifying, like, usually what I tell physicians is try to see where your employees fit in these buckets and see what you can do to keep the engaged, really engaged and motivated and moving and have them also help move your disengaged over. You're actively disengaged. You've got to find a time when you just call it quits with those type of employees, you know, that's where you're headed down sometimes the performance path. But if you're looking at all of your employees and you're putting them in the actively disengaged bucket, I would say you need to look at yourself and your practices and see what's happening there. Because how is it that you're hiring all of these actively disengaged or continuing to have a climate of a lot of actively disengaged employees? Yeah. And, and I'll bet you that many practice owners or, or them and, and between them and maybe like, you know, the practice manager, or the practice lead could probably just, you know, look at the, at the roster of people and say, you know, these people and, and probably get an 80% good, you know, this, these five are, they're really engaged. These five, it's probably the one that are really actively disengaged. It might be the ones in the middle that you might straddle. Well, I don't want sure, but that's okay. I mean, just on a quick glance, you probably, if you're paying any attention and you're honest about it, you probably can tell, you know, which is a good start. Yeah. And that's like that honesty is so critical, right? And creating that self-awareness. I mean, as a leader running a private practice, especially you've got to have that self-awareness to how your leadership style is and what's happening around you. So another thing about measurement is the Gallup actually has an engagement survey. So you can actually measure and identify like who's really feeling engaged, who's not. And it's a, it's a 12 step question. It's like 12 questions. You could give it out or you don't have to give it out. But what it does is it really clues you into what could you be working on as a physician to try to get people engaged or try to like see what could help move the dial. So yeah. curious, Carl? <laughs> I, I am. And, and you, you actually, I was going to ask um, because Doctors, you know, they're they're used to clinical science, right? There, there's a, even though not all clinical studies are randomized control perspective, double blind, and it's, you know, the cause and effect isn't 100% clear. They're used to, if I do this, I get that. And yeah. yes, there's squishiness in it. But here in the world we're talking about now, I've read some other Gallup stuff, and it, it's as good as it gets in terms of 
this input creates that output. But nevertheless, it's still more in the world of social science, not clinical science. And so sure. I, I, can, I can feel some of the, you know, practice owner, doctor listeners out there just maybe cringing a touch, but nevertheless, I mean, you know, tell us a bit about the Gallup and how they've gotten this to about as, as authoritative as it's going to get. Yeah. So they've figured out that if you really want to move the dial on creating engaged culture and engaged workplace, it will lower your absenteeism. It will lower your turnover rates. It will increase your productivity and profitability. I mean, think about even the type of patient population you're trying to attract to your practice. If you're trying to attract, for example, PPO or Medicare patients who have choice, right? Why mm -hmm. are they going to choose you? Often they don't, they don't decline choosing a physician, not because of the physician itself. It's everything around the physician's practice. It's the person who greeted them at the front. It's the person who made their appointment. It's the person who dealt with their billing. You know, so the, the staff and the engagement of the staff is really critical because the more engaged they are, the more happier they are going to deal with your patients. So all of this is really, really important. Now, how as a physician practice leader, you're going to figure this out. So I'm going to walk through the Q12 really briefly. So imagine a pyramid, okay? And this pyramid is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You can't really work on the top of the pyramid and the questions at the top, unless the base and the foundation is solid, right? right. The basic needs are met. Right. So the first question in the Gallup survey is, do I know what is expected of me at work? So think about that for a second. It sounds deceptively like it should be simple, but it's probably not that simple, right? You pull yeah, out your job description I mean, and there it is. Yeah. I mean, think about when's the last time as a physician, any other physicians listening here, you've talked to your NP, your PA, your MA, your biller, whomever about how you measure their performance. What and I'll do bet you none of them do. Yeah. And I'll bet you there's not a single job description out there that says, pick up the trash that you see on the floor as you walk by it, but it's an <laughs> expectation of everybody, but it's more an or less. Yeah. yeah. You want to, you know, and so Sometimes what we do as leaders is we make the mistake of, isn't this common sense? Isn't right. it obvious? Well, let me, you know, newsflash, physicians, you have a higher than average IQ. We know this. We know the science tells us. You couldn't have gotten through medical school without academic success and excellence. Right. And IQ measures academic success and excellence. It doesn't necessarily mean your EQ, which is a thought for, talk for another, right. um, it's a whole other topic. Is, is going to be up there. And so do not assume even the most simple and basic things, which is that my staff knows what's expected of them. Yep. You know? Yeah. And the, the other layer of it is you're the owner and they're not. And I've been there yeah. where, you know, think like an owner, yeah. well, make me an owner. I mean, it's, 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 it's a much longer bridge to go from an employee mindset to an owner mindset. And an employee mindset is not a negative. Yeah. It's a reality. And, and, and yeah. yet the engaged ones pick up the trash because they feel like it's their floor, yeah. you know, not somebody else's. And, and it's, you just, those of you who are listening, you just kind of have to swallow hard and embrace these things because they're real, you know, and you can rail against them, but they're not going to change. It's up to you yeah. to try to pull more out of these people. So if you assume they're going to be kind to your patients, tell them that's your expectation. Don't just assume it. Right. You, know, like, you have to say a lot more things than you. You've got to say exactly what you expect of them. Yeah. So that, and then if you're going to do some type of performance review process, which you should look working with your office manager, whether it's annual, I really like the quarterly check-ins. I, I do like, you know, thinking about incentivizing, whether mm -hmm. it's an annual bonus or something like, you know, like a, uh, short-term rewards or awards, yep. but do it when they have exceeded your expectations Yeah, or even met them, you know, even yeah. if that's an improvement from where you're at right now, but first start with the expectations. The second question on the survey is, do I have the materials and equipment I need to do my job? Sounds fairly obvious. It does. So if one of your staff members is complaining about the mouse not being comfortable, 
It's 20 bucks. Change the mouse. (laughs) It's true. true. Little things. Don't penny pinch this kind of stuff. It's a factor in engagement. I'm giving you data driven advice here. Right. Keep going. What's the, what's, what's some of the other questions? Uh, The third question is, do I have an opportunity to do my best every day at work? So this is the strengths question, what we yeah. call the strengths question. Do you know what the strengths are of your staff and are they in the right positions that plays to their strengths? Do they have an ability to do that? If someone feels excited about party planning, then make them the designated planner of everyone's birthdays to like, you know, decorate the place and whatever, give them right. a budget to do it with. Right. Right. If someone really doesn't like talking to people, is a little bit more introverted, see if you can keep them in more back office type functions than front office functions. Okay. You know, like little things like this, like cluing yeah. into what are their strengths. Yeah. And if you don't know what they are, ask them, ask others around them. Yeah. Um, there's also an assessment for this. You can have them take and identify it. Right. And what's neat about it is like these aren't mountain moving changes in yeah. most cases that you need to make. And, and it's the little things it's very cliche to say, but it can be the little things that can make a big difference. Well, and also gets you talking with your staff, right? Asking these questions and they're not just general questions of how are you today? How was your weekend? It's another conversation starter, right? Like, yeah. Hey, have we ever talked about expectations? Let's, let's have right. a conversation. Right. What do you expect from me as your, as the physician here? Yeah. What can I do to better support you? Yeah. At the same time, here's what's, you know, what I'm expecting from you. And it's a conversation now, and you're building that relationship with yep. that person. Yep. And then you're also finding a better way to communicate with them in a style that may be comfortable for them. Right. right. Now, you said something earlier, you mentioned practice manager, and yeah. my head immediately went to, I learned that a practice, it, it's God bless the people who can do that job out there. It's a job yeah, I never absolutely. want. It's like the, you are the chief business officer. Some, in some cases, you're the chief dumping ground yeah. by everybody, including the owners. And I can picture some, some doctor owners um, offsourcing this onto the practice manager, go figure out all this employee engagement stuff. Yeah. Why My is advice, that? That is yeah. a recipe for disaster, right? It I mean, is. But, but tell us why. Be, it's got to be a joint effort. Because there are going to be situations where the practice manager isn't around, like, especially when you're working with your MA in the clinic room, the practice manager isn't there. So you are going to be able to evaluate that person and sense things and see things a little differently. Yeah. So that'd be great that the MA has a good relationship with the practice manager, but also needs a relationship with you. And engagement is a tool through which you can develop better relationships. And so you can even ask other questions too, like the fourth question on the survey, which goes from the basic needs to a little bit higher in terms of showing compassion as a leader is how do people want to be awarded and recognized? Do they want to be recognized in private? Do they want it publicly? Do they want it in writing? Do they want it verbally? And the best way to find out is to ask them, how do you Hmm. like to be recognized? That's simple. Yeah, because sometimes we assume, we assume people want to be recognized the way we want to be recognized. Or we heard, you know, Dr. So-and-so, our friend from down the street at a different practice does yeah. these other things. We you should know, do it takes that way. The staff on their boating trips. We should do that. Right. And it's like, but how do you know your staff really likes that? Yeah. You know, and that's how they want to be recognized. Yeah. Talk to them, ask them. Um, I recently did an icebreaker for one of the workshops I was running. And I started off with asking everyone to say their name, their role. So this was a team that works mm-hmm. together and how they want to be recognized. And one of the things they remembered most from the workshop was learning about their colleagues, about how they want to be recognized, because now they're going to think about doing that. So it's not only the boss doing it with the employees, it's the employees also understanding and hearing about doing it with each other. Did, did the boss hear all that too? <laughs> Maybe make a note of it <laughs> the somewhere? The boss will, because it was part of a focus group and I'll be talking ah, to the boss later. So. Perfect. Okay, perfect. That would be, that would be funny. I took copious notes. Yes. Tragically (laughs) funny if it never got back. (laughs) That's right. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So there's and there's other questions in the survey too, you know, related to and if you if you Google Gallup Q12 employee engagement survey, you'll get all the questions. But there's questions about someone cares about my development, they care about me. There's a forum, you know, like my opinions count. I'm dedicated to the mission and purpose of the organization. I mean, yeah. I don't know a lot of doctor's offices that have a mission statement. Do you, Carl? No, I do not. Um, you know, it's something you'd like to be able to see on a wall somewhere. Yeah. Ideally, and really in 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 on the wall of every room because for two reasons. One is it reminded it says it's really important. We just took the time just to put it up on every wall. Must yeah. be important. Number one, number two, added benefit, patients see it. Absolutely. And if, and, and what could be bad about that? I mean, they, yes. some of them will take it seriously also, or realize that added, the practice is taking it seriously. Yeah. And added benefit three is Gallup and the employee engagement data gurus say that you want employees to understand the mission and purpose of the organization they work for and be dedicated to it. How are they going to be dedicated to it if they don't know what it is? Correct. And, and then there's training to make sure people all understand it the same way. And then when there's turnover, there's new people. So but regardless, I mean, the universal step one is get clear on what engagement means to your staff uh, and what your culture is behind it, which is another podcast episode because culture is an even bigger topic than employee engagement. Yeah. <laughs> that could be a whole series. That was a, if you feel like employee engagement might feel a little fluffy, then culture is, you know, times 10, but yeah. it's that important. Uh, and yeah. so it's worth working through the, the gray areas um, to try to get one that's good for you. Yes, we, we, you know, Ashi, this is, this is really, really cool stuff. And uh, as I've said on other podcast episodes, man, we, we could spend so much time on this, but in the interest of kind of, you know, sort of, you know, wrapping it up a touch, um, a couple of questions I ask everybody at the end is, first is, is there anything that I, you think I should have asked you, but just didn't? No, I think you were great. I, I love the conversational flow and I'm hoping that people got some key takeaways from listening to us today. Me too, me too. Um, and then the other question is, if we step back from the conversation and, and there's somebody listening to this, they either work in a practice or they own a practice and they, you know, they're, they're interested in this, what are one or two things they could do as soon as they're done listening to, to, to get started, you know, on their, in their practice? And I wrote something down you mentioned about, you know, even patients can tell if it's really, yeah. and so one of the things that I thought was, you know, see if, do you feel like you get a lot of first visits, but the patients never come back? Like mm -hmm. there, there's some, there's probably some natural percentage of that for every yeah. specialty, but do you think you're higher? Do you wonder if that's going on out there? That might be a signal that, um, you know, maybe there's something deeper and it's got nothing to do with the patients or maybe in part. It's or your of, clinical, yeah, or your clinical expertise, you know, they might yeah. be they're getting great clinical care, but it might be something else. Around. It might be something else. They just, you know, yeah. can every day be a bad day at the front desk? Probably yeah. not, <laughs> yeah. you know, so, so that's one thing, but are there a couple of other tangible steps if somebody wanted to, you know, do we have an engagement issue or I want to find out more? What, do, what would you tell them to do? Yeah, I would start with, first of all, when do you ever even talk about it? So bring it up. So have a staff meeting with your practice manager, um, even start with your practice manager. I mean, that's really the most basic thing, right? Start with your practice manager, right. have a conversation. The second thing is whenever you're having team meetings, dedicate about 10 or 15 minutes to it. You know, don't make them all about everything in terms of the operations and the business also have like an engagement portion of it, which will be something such as go around the room and ask like, Hey, you know, what's, what's a pet peeve here at work for you? Let's talk about a pet peeve or let's talk about how you want to be recognized, or let's talk about what do you think are the strengths of the person sitting next to you? So you're having these conversations around the engagement kind of questionnaire and survey. So it's giving you a clue into where you might see some gaps. There might be some gaps in people. And, and also it's helping to drive engagement by having these conversations because the staff are going to start seeing, wow, this practice owner really cares. Right. So, but if you ask a question about, you know, whatever it is, just make sure that when you, you do, you do something with the answers. Yes. Don't just pay a lip service because that'll get sniffed out 
in a New York nanosecond. Um, really fast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you want to make your engagement even worse than whatever it is, ask questions like that and then do nothing with the answers. So just pick your, pick your shots carefully. Agreed. Well, thank you, Ashi. This is great. We, we, I feel like we dug into this a little bit. Hopefully for those listening, employee engagement feels a lot more approachable and tangible uh, than it did before. Um, if you haven't heard about Gallup and the strength of their research, look it up. It's impressive. It's about as good as it gets for you know, the soft side of social science, but it's, it's really, really impressive stuff. We will put, I will put your uh, contact info, Ashi, in the show notes, but is there a preferred way if somebody wants to contact you, is it, do you have a preferred way for them? Yeah, um, two preferred ways. One right. is email me directly. I'm very comfortable with getting direct emails for any questions or if you want to talk further about this, ashi at iriseexecutivecoaching.com mm-hmm. or find me on LinkedIn, Ashi Aurora, and send me a message. Perfect. And Ashi is A A S H I. I've made that mistake. So yes. now I know I not <laughs> to make it anymore. <laughs> two A's at the beginning, world of difference. Perfect. So couple of wrap up points before we go. If you're, li- if you've listened to this and you've had an experience on the business side of your practice or your people like Ashi and I, who, who service those who run private practices, and you've got some expertise that you want to share, we want to have you on practice care so that you can share your experience, uh, share your expertise with the world. Go to the website. It'll be in the show notes. There's a, there's a form you fill out. Please do so. So we can get yourself, we can get you scheduled as soon as possible. And finally, please make sure to subscribe on practice, subscribe to Practice Care on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks very much. And until next time.